Okay, hello Buddhist Geeks, this is Vincent Horn, and I'm joined today live over Google Hangout. This is our first live Google Hangout interview, so very excited to be joined by our guest today, uh, Dr. Ronald Purser. Uh, Ron, thanks so much for taking the time to chat with the Buddhist Geeks and to explore with us. It's a pleasure to be here, Vince. Yeah, it's a pleasure to see you. This is the first time I've done a live interview where I can actually see who I'm talking to uh, in, in terms of online. Yeah, I think it makes a big difference. It does. Cool. So I just wanted to start by sharing a little bit uh, of your background, and then we can actually go deeper into it um, and explore a little bit of kind of what you're bringing to the table and, and what your background is. Um, sure. So, so just to start, um, you're a professor now of management at San Francisco State University, and your scholarship and research and writing has sort of focused recently on organizational mindfulness, uh, mindfulness in corporate settings, and how Buddhist philosophy can inform organizational theory and practice. Um, so. I'd be curious to hear, because that's a very interesting uh, confluence, you know, organizational uh, management and Buddhist philosophy. I'd be curious to hear kind of what your background is uh, in, in both sides of that, of that coming together um, so that we can kind of get a sense for yeah, so what your sort of um, uh, background is. Sure. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be on Buddhist Geeks. So I've become a real fan uh, over the last uh, year or so. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, well, I received my doctorate uh, in organizational behavior, um, I think it was in 1990, at Case Western Reserve University. And that's, that's an interesting field um, because it is very uh, interdisciplinary. It sort of is a combination of organizational uh, behavior, organizational psychology, social psychology, uh, <clears throat> industrial relations, organization development. Um, and I was a Buddhist even before I entered graduate school, I mean, going back to 1981. Um, so this has always been in the background uh, of my professional uh, interest and career, but it's only like in the last two or three years that I've been able to sort of uh, integrate or shift my professional focus to try to, to bring together my my lifetime interest and in practice of Buddhism uh, into the real world of uh, organizational development and uh, what's happening right now in terms of the interest uh, among many businesses and corporations uh, uh, with the mindfulness movement. Um, but I guess it's it's been a life it's been a career struggle uh, because I've I've sort of kept it in the background and you know if we look now what's happening uh, mindfulness in cor in the corporate world is is wide open it's it's become mainstream almost so when I started to see that trend develop uh, I said you know I really need to just completely. Uh, fully uh, apply my professional energies to uh, seeing how the Buddha Dharma can actually inform the way we organize in society. Uh, you know, what what sort of benefits can we bring from uh, the Buddha Dharma into organizational theory and organizational practice? So it's been very uh, inspirational for me. Uh, it's kind of a whole new phase of. Uh, creativity. Um, I'm very excited. Nice. And you said you actually got, got into Buddhism before you got into the into graduate schools. How, how did you get introduced to it and, and what, what sort of has your trajectory been in that in that space? <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, yeah. granted, we, we, don't, we don't have... Yeah, uh, I know, just a in, brief... In a, uh, in a short... Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, to make a long story short, um, <laughs> well, you know, as a, as a late teenager, yeah, you know, we started dabbling and by reading books by Alan Watts, like many of us, and things like that. But it wasn't until I was around 28 years old or so uh, that I seriously, you know, took the plunge. And the Nikma Institute in, in uh, Berkeley, California, uh, Tarthang Tuku's Institute, is really was my first uh, entry, uh, and uh, that was actually interesting because it started more uh, with his more secular vision, which was. Uh, known as Time, Space, and Knowledge, uh, the series of books that he offered to the West, which he 
adamantly says is not Buddhist, but I, I had a lot of other Buddhist things going on at Nigma. And then uh, 1985, when I went to graduate school in Cleveland, the only uh, Buddhist center there was a, uh, uh, actually it was the Buddhist Churches of America, uh, but uh, the uh, the sensei there, sensei uh, uh, Ogui, uh, had a Zen center uh, in the evening for, for the American Western students. So that was around 1985, and I uh, took my uh, formal Zen precepts at that time. Okay. So I've had a number of Zen teachers since then, and uh, also uh, participated in a number of retreats with Chokyunima and some other uh, uh, Nigma and Kagyu uh, Vajrayana teachers. Okay. okay, cool. And then it sounds like at some point, as the mindfulness and corporate space thing was taking off, you decided to actually bring that into the foreground of your work with the organizational stuff. That's, that's neat. Yeah, yeah. In fact, I remember reading an article in 2006 in a journal in my field that was actually trying to explicitly bring in uh, what they called Eastern, uh, but it was definitely a Buddhist uh, uh, concepts from the RB Dharma and so forth. Uh, this particular journal was, was trying to uh, import uh, Buddhist concepts into a theory of organizational mindfulness. And I, I remember reading it in 2006 and then finally I, I decided to, to do something and, and that's when I wrote this particular article now. Okay. Uh, which uh, is actually meant as sort of a response to that article. Okay, cool. And you know, I was really struck by this article and also by the general kind of need to critique this exploding trend. I mean, everyone that's watching this show knows that mindfulness practices, things like MBSR, uh, MBCT, have become incredibly popular. Uh, as you put in the article, they've become exponentially popular um, in the last uh, several years. And that doesn't seem to be a trend that's going to be slowing down anytime soon. Lisa's no, and I, I think it's it's wonderful that uh, MBSR and MBCT uh, have uh, gotten the attention that uh, they have in the clinical and hospital uh, settings. Uh, I mean, it's wonderful what they've done. Uh, my critique is not necessarily uh, aimed at MBSR. It's more that that's not all there is uh, to mm -hmm. mindfulness. And... Um, you know, I think people even that have been on Buddhist Geeks, like uh, Dave, uh, Dave Vago and uh, Willoughby Britton, I mean, they're, they're really on the leading edge, too, of seeing that uh, we really need to go beyond which these, you know, the operational definitions that have sort of dominated the clinical psychology and even the neuroscience field based on more of an, uh, what I would consider uh, limited uh, conception of mindfulness and uh, that, that's really what I was really after is, is to try to expand our knowledge uh, and our perspective on mindfulness and see how it is really uh, embedded and, and contextualized within a highly integrated system of ethical and soteriological uh, principles. Okay, cool. And, you know, reading the article in the abstract, which is sort of spelling out, okay, here's what's going to come in the next 40 pages, um, yeah. there is one line in particular that I thought was very interesting, and I wanted to see if we could unpack it a little bit, and you've already kind of gotten into uh, a little mm -hmm. bit of what I wanted to explore with you, which is you, you and your co-author wrote that mindfulness div divorced from its uh, soteriological or, or liberative context can be reduced to self-help technique that's easily misappropriated for self-preservation, employee pacification, and mm -hmm. maintenance of toxic cultures. Yeah. So <laughs> that's a strong statement, obviously. And uh, I was wondering if you could say a bit more, starting with um, what you were just speaking about, which is what is uh, mindfulness in terms of how you're using that term uh, for the purposes of this article? And how is that different from the way that we often, popular, uh, in a popular context, understand mindfulness, you know, uh, like the way that John Kabat-Zinn is using it, or it's used in, in sort of the Western secular context? Right. Well, yeah, I think that what 
I'm trying to do is to recontextualize mindfulness and because as you have mentioned the the current uh, discourse uh, is sort of narrowly focused on uh, what I term attention enhancement. Uh, that is sort of what, how we have come to view mindfulness. It's not the only uh, aspect of it, but it is a fairly narrow conception. And um, I'm really drawing more uh, directly from uh, Buddhist canonical sources, directly uh, from the Satipat Maha Satipatthana Anapa Sati Suttas. Um, and trying to shift that discourse away from just some sort of instrumentalized view of mindfulness. Um, I mean, really, if we uh, really look at uh, the issue here, um, we have to think about mindfulness not as a technique. Uh, I think the, the the phrase now is mindfulness. You know, it's a technique. And the reason why it's a technique is because it has become decontextualized. Um, from its uh, uh, ethical uh, context and I think one of the misconceptions or common misconceptions is that mindfulness uh, is devoid of any kind of judgment or discrimination and uh, I think that there of course there are times in practice where there is non-judgment or non-reactive uh, uh, non-reactivity to the contents of arising of experience, but I think what we're talking about is that the uh, quality of mindfulness is sati is also combined with sampajana, which uh, often is translated as clear comprehension uh, or clear knowing which kind of implies a self-monitoring, a kind of, kind of a self-awareness or discrimination of one's motivations and whether one is uh, actually developing wholesome uh, qualities. But one of the uh, issues is that um, if we look at the definition of uh, MBSR, for example, it differs dramatically from the canonical definitions of mindfulness. If you don't mind, could I read a quick quote from uh, Bhikkhu Thanissaro? Absolutely. Okay, Bhikkhu Thanissaro, um, I think he really sums it up quite nicely because he um, says, one of the <clears throat> most striking features of mindfulness as taught in the modern world is how far it differs from the canon's teachings on right mindfulness. And instead of being a function of memory, which Sati sort of has connotations of recollection and memory. I'm sort of ad-libbing here. It's, de it's depicted primarily in some cases purely as a function of attention to the present moment. And instead of being purposeful, in without, it is without an agenda. And instead of making choices, it's depicted as being choiceless and without preferences. And I thought, wow, that, that really struck me when I read that. Um, you know, I think another term that is possibly causing some confusion in the way it's used is the term bare attention. And, you know, Bhikkhu Bodhi actually uh, had something to say about this too in one of the articles in Contemporary Buddhism, a special issue. And he said the problem with bare attention, it was initially, you know, meant uh, to be used more as a pedagogical device to help people get a flavor of of mindfulness uh, but um, he never intended it to be you know a real uh, concrete operational factor in the, in the definition of mindfulness and so what happens is is that bare attention uh, is often conflated with manasakara which uh, is a in the uh, Abhidharma is a universal mental factor of attention which is uh, ethically neutral. Uh, Bhikkhu Bodhi says, you know, well, you know, if we're only talking about attention, uh, we could have concentrated attention. The sniper can benefit from bare attention or a high degree of concentration. Uh, and, and so we kind of lose the uh, ethical side of mindfulness by 
this decontextualization uh, of, of the uh, definition. Um, yeah. Okay, great. So, so there's an, uh, a way in which the ethical dimensions lost, and then there's also, uh, which is kind of looking at it as a value-free practice or technique, and then there's also the the kind of uh, liberative dimensions seems to be lost in, in, in how he's describing that, where we're no longer sort of looking at our own motivation while we're paying attention and seeing, you know, what, what, what things are we strengthening and what things are we actually looking to uh, to let go of or, or, or not cultivate or, or develop. And so that's that's kind of interesting, the uh, the difference there. It's pretty clear. And I've, I've heard other, you know, teachers and people uh, speak about this. Ken McLeod, Alan Wallace, many people have written about um, the difference in, in those terms and how they're used. Um, yeah, absolutely right. Uh, I, I really um, admire all of the all of those writings by the people you've mentioned, and they've informed my my thinking as well. Um, yeah, I, I think that we actually lose the uh, the wider view uh, if we view mindfulness as some sort of instrumentalized technique. Uh, even 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 if we view it more as a technique for just even improving our mental health or physical health, we lose the, the wider liberative uh, dimension of mindfulness or purpose and function of mindfulness. Um, and so I think that we have to you know, back up a bit and, and think about why uh, in the Eightfold Path uh, was mindfulness differentiated uh, qualitatively between right and wrong mindfulness, not not in a moralistic sense, but samasati, right mindfulness, uh, it's really characterized by the quality of attention that's brought to bear on experience and, and in one's actions. So it's a distinct quality of attention that's deliberately cultivated, uh, supported by the integrated uh, sense of uh, ethical development that, uh, of course, the Buddhist uh, path is uh, uh, known for in terms of sila and the ethical training. Um, so in a way, we, we could kind of reframe this as uh, trying to move more towards an ethic-based uh, mindfulness training where uh, the dimension of ethics is uh, brought fully into focus. And I think this is the corrective that we need to overcome mindfulness getting stuck uh, in, and instrumentalized, commodified, uh, and reduced to a self-help technique. And I think it's worth sort of pointing out that, like at least from what I can hear in what you're saying, is that you're not you're not saying let's go back to uh, and promote a strictly Buddhist understanding of mindfulness. Um, rather, you're saying let's go back and retouch into that and see what we're missing in our current conception of mindfulness and, and sort of uh, make some adjustments uh, at least and granted you can't change how it's being interpreted by everyone but you know you can you can you can do things differently if, if, if that's the field you're in and that's what you're up to so does that sound accurate I mean yeah that's absolutely right I uh, you know, I'm not in any shape or form, you know, trying to be a Buddhist fundamentalist and saying, no, we have to, you know, all become uh, traditional canonical adherence to, you know, the the canon and any, anything like that. But, you know, th there's room for uh, development and creativity on how we can reconceptualize mindfulness so that it doesn't just uh, become a passing fad. I mean, that's one of my concerns is that if we look at organizations and corporations, uh, they're notorious for uh, the cycles of fads that come and go. And I think that there's still time to, you could say, recover or redirect or reclaim uh, this movement in such a way that uh, it doesn't uh, bite the dust uh, because it uh, it does offer tremendous value to how we can transform you know the basic uh, institution of our society where we spend most of our time is in, at the workplace mm. so I, I think that uh, there's a great opportunity here for us to 
seriously uh, engage in the discourse in such a way that um, we can raise questions that we're raising uh, as we are here today. Mm. So going back to this um, sort of concern that you have about the ways that mindfulness, as it's currently understood and formulated, um, and the way that it's being adopted. I mean, I was recently in San Francisco, you know, for the Wisdom 2.0 conference, and mm -hmm. um, there were thousands of people there, and many of them working in businesses um, and wanting to bring mindfulness into businesses. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was very clear that this trend is, is blowing yeah. up in, in that space in particular. And, you know, uh, having practiced in the Buddhist tradition and done, you know, a lot of meditation, I heard all kinds of things that I, I was also concerned about. And one of them that, that you bring up yourself here is... Um, is about mindfulness being used as a way to pacify employees or as a tool that organizations use to to kind of get more out of their employees in terms of productivity and things like that. Um, right. And I actually, I just want to share a little kind of anecdote from, from my experience at Wisdom because I think it's related to this and then I also want to hear kind of your thoughts on this, which sure. is while I was there I noticed um, that narrative was was quite strong the narrative that you know mindfulness is a way to enhance productivity for employees to be happier in the workplace um, that was very public in in the actual conference um, and I, I'm not saying there's no truth to that but but that right. was the kind of the main narrative and then in private I talked to several people who were sharing stories of folks that they knew directly who had started doing mindfulness or meditation practice and at work and who subsequently quit their jobs uh, within you know days or weeks after starting to train because it highlighted and, and something for them about how how the systems they were in or or the the experience they were having was dysfunctional and Absolutely. and that was quite different of a of a observation than than the one it was actually complete opposite to um, the one that I was hearing you know sort of being. I think excitedly explored at, at the conference and I found those two different narratives you know in direct kind of competition and I was wondering if you could say a little bit about this this whole notion of uh, a pacifying employees as opposed to it being something that you know may lead to them actually quitting the workplace if it's if the systems that they're in are dysfunctional and they're working 80 hours a week or whatever yeah I, I think that's very interesting um, and I, I, I mentioned in the paper actually uh, a similar uh, fad that uh, was called the human relations movement back in the 1930s, 1940s, 1950s. Uh, it was often derogatorily uh, referred to as cow psychology uh, by its critics. And, and basically uh, the human relations movement was teaching supervisors how to sort of be like uh, warm and fuzzy counselors uh, to their employees and so they would you know ask them their concerns and, and everything and then the employees would basically feel a lot better but go right back to the same exact uh, work environment nothing actually changed whatsoever and so that's you know not something new in the corporate world um, and, and I think this is really what I think in terms of how um, we basically shift the burden uh, onto the employee. I mean, okay, we need to reduce stress. There's a lot of stress, certainly, in the workplace. And so let's give them this privatized, individualistic training called uh, stress reduction or mindfulness. Uh, because it's really, you know, your problem and, 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 you know, we really need to get you to adapt and have you cope as effectively as possible in the existing corporate culture. But there's really no questioning of you know why is there so much stress in that corporate culture to begin with? We don't really look at the collective sources of distress uh, and and harmful uh, corporate cultures, toxic corporate cultures that are the reason why we have to have so much uh, uh, mindfulness practice in corporations. So you know the this is sort of you know colonization is the word or you know exploitation may be too strong. But it certainly requires this uncoupling of mindfulness from its from its ethical context, and when you do that, what happens? It turns it into kind of this highly privatized uh, technique, 
uh, it becomes uh, a way to actually pacify anxiety and stress. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. We, I mean, everybody uh, can benefit from it, but it doesn't address the sources of, of what David Loy would consider our institutionalized uh, social dukkha or the uh, institutionalized greed or institutionalized ill will, institutionalized delusion. Um, and, and I think that's where we really need to expand our thinking is, you know, sanghas, you know, Buddhist sanghas were there for a reason. In a sense, they were the laboratory for how we can uh, go beyond ourselves, not cultivate uh, ourself even further and, and enhance our sense of uh, self-importance. Uh, and, and, and so in a way, this is kind of perpetuating almost like a religion of the self. Uh, it becomes very privatized. It's almost kind of very, maybe even perpetuating, you know, the consumerist uh, lifestyle. Um, it kind of reminds me in a way, this may be a bit of a far st stretch, but almost of the prosperity religions that we saw uh, uh, U.S. Uh, televangelist. You know, if you, if you follow this, you know, you're going to be more prosperous. In a way, it's not that far stretched because mindfulness is often sold as a, a way to enhance your career success, uh, a way to become more focused, and everything is focused more on how you can get ahead. You know, or how you will be able to fit into the existing corporate culture, and and to me that is really a fundamental sort of refashioning of, of mindfulness. It's 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 you know moving away from its liberative uh, function and purpose. Okay. Okay. Interesting. I, I want to take. I want to take this because it, I, I think as I as I as I listen to you, that there's one thing I I keep noticing I, I have trouble with, which is mm -hmm. that we are so there's a critique of the way we've refashioned mindfulness, but there's not a you're not saying that we shouldn't refashion mindfulness because one of the aspects you talked about that David Loy, you know, mentions the sense of social dukkha, you know, mm -hmm. uh, to address social dukkha, you know, if we go back to the canonical sources and stuff like that, and I'm no academic myself, yeah. but I, I've looked at it enough to realize um, original sort of source Buddhism was not primarily looking at transforming social institutions. There was a little bit of that going on. Uh, right. Obviously, but but uh, on, in the same way, there wasn't really a, a language or a lens for understanding systems and cultures and things like that. All of this has sort of developed in the last few hundred years. So um, clearly, we are refashioning mindfulness even as we talk about it. So the question that I have for you is, how do we refashion mindfulness in organizational context? Because I know that's also something that you write about. Um, what what are the ways that we can actually refashion it in a way that is focused on the sort of uh, alleviation of social uh, injustice or suffering because that's obviously a really important dimension um, especially in, in today's world yeah I agree and I think one of the, the first things is that we have to recognize that and I think this is just a trend within Western Buddhism itself is that uh, you know, Buddhism is often equated with meditation, period. And, you know, that is one of the problems that we're dealing with is that, you know, the Buddha, you know, just didn't teach meditation for the long career that he had. He, he, he did teach a form of social ethics. Mm -hmm. And there was a lot more that he was teaching besides mindfulness. And I think a lot of people forget that fact. But I think... Uh, the fundamental issue here is when we try to narrowly extract uh, uh, mindfulness, uh, which is embedded in a very integrated uh, system of uh, psycho-spiritual development, uh, we lose the whole emancipatory capacity that it was intended behind uh, this uh, beautiful approach. And it wasn't just uh, to be more, well he more healthy, happy, and so forth, but I mean, we're really talking about uh, a much uh, greater vision uh, of an awakened society. So we have to 
think creatively, and I was thinking about this last night a bit, is that um, is there's a tension, I think, an ongoing tension between tradition and innovation. Uh, and we have to hold that tension. Uh, in a way, they're, they're opposites. And, uh, we, you know, we can't go in either extreme. I think this is kind of a middle path of how we can refashion uh, mindfulness for social systems. And one of the things I think is that um, what I'm calling uh, in the paper is a concept I'm trying to, to develop is called high wisdom organizations, HWOs. And it's a way to think about mindfulness not just as an individualized uh, practice, but a way to extend that to all of the organizational processes and practices uh, that uh, are part of a corporate culture. So by doing that, we, we widen the scope to look at the collective sources of distress and suffering that David Lloyd calls social dukkha or institutionalized dukkha, a systemic dukkha. And so uh, we look at what I refer to as mindful organizing processes. And these are ways of how do, can we de-automatize our habitual routines in organizations, which sort of seem normal because we've never really become uh, clear about them and maybe that kind of relates to the uh, story you told of why some of the people who started practicing quit because they suddenly you know started to awaken and, and feel this more sensitively that the suffering that they were embedded in mm. and so you know high wisdom organizations is kind of a new intervention I think that we need to develop that's really grounded in a strong ethical intentions in, in terms of what uh, what the vision is of, of what we're considering uh, healthy organizations or virtuous organizations, if you want to call it that. Uh, I don't want to get into all of the details of the theoretical aspects of it, but uh, certainly we, we need to move away from seeing mindfulness as merely a, te merely a technique for self-fulfillment at the expense of ignoring all the suffering that's happening within the corporation or within a social system. And so, you know, it, in this sense, um, mindfulness is not just a way to help individuals cope or adapt or accommodate or even accept a dysfunctional culture or, home, or more harmful social environments. So uh, I don't think this is going to happen overnight, but certainly I think that... Uh, there are people besides me that are starting to think in these terms. Uh, of course, the the movement that we're dealing with is so oriented towards uh, uh, self self cultivation rather than uh, yes. seeing. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. Yeah, I I do. I mean um, that. In many ways, that's the context in which I've done most of my practice, and being exposed to people like David and uh, and others outside of the Buddhist context, it's you know sort of bringing that other dimension, the social dimension, in, um, which I think is really it's really important, not just in the sense of um, not just in the sense of letting sort of letting go of, of our sort of self-preoccupation, because that can become a self-preoccupation, <laughs> to yeah. let go of our own self-preoccupation, but just right. simply because that's what's needed. Um, it's what's needed in the world, and what I hear you saying is, uh, in some ways, there's this, there's this, there are these deeper cultural trends that once we become aware of, once we make an object, which happens, you know, through our own individual awareness, but it also happens in a societal way, that then we, we have a sort of obligation in some sense to respond to those things and to actually change them as opposed to like like you're saying use this technique as a way to uh, with bare attention accept uh, that that's the way things are so I, I think what you're saying is really uh, it's a really powerful uh, I, I think it shouldn't be understated you know how important that that statement is um, in the sense that it's a, it's also a societal um, practice of transformation 
So I, I, I just wanted to, you know, just say that that because it, it is really important uh, what you're saying. I think. Yeah, and I think that um, it really, it really comes down to this this notion of uncoupling mindfulness again, uh, because what happens is you know, it becomes very myopic, and we we limit the scope or the breadth of of the potential of transformation. And so this rush towards uh, seeing it as a self help, self help technique uh, really just glosses over the uh, ethical dimensions that really fuel the transformative potential uh, of this uh, practice. Um, so when it's focused strictly on the individual, uh, I think it's that's when it becomes more technocratic in its usage. Um, so rather than like throwing the baby out with the bathwater, um, I really think that um, we have to to look at what happens when that occurs because then it becomes a very compartmentalized uh, uh, practice, uh, and in that case, the benefits are only stress reduction and improved attention when we compartmentalize it like that. Mm. Um, so, um, I think we have a lot of work to do. <laughs> um. Cool. No, thank you for that. I, I, I think that's a good place, you know, to wrap up the formal part of the interview. And I was wondering. Um, if you have a little time for for maybe a couple questions, sure. Looks like we have another fifteen minutes or so. Cool. So um, we wanted to open it up. You know, we're, we're we've sort of ended the formal podcast interview, but we wanted to open it up to uh, the Buddhist Geeks community uh, members who are here live. Um, so uh, what's going to happen is we'll we'll post a little link. If you have a question, you want to come on and ask Ronald or uh, a comment. Um, that he could respond to, uh, just click the link and you'll be brought into the actual Hangout. Um, and then we'll uh, bring you in and, and you can sort of bring up your question, comment, and we'll have a, just a little time for a little conversation and dialogue so we can kind of expand it outside of my questions and to include the questions of the collective because I think there's there's a lot of uh, wisdom there that certainly I can't tap into myself. So. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah, and if we don't have any questions, no one, no one wants to ask a question, that's fine too. We can... Uh, Leave it with. We've got a lot of work to do. <laughs> <laughs> and Ron, thanks again for uh, experimenting with us in this new um, sort of format that we're using. Sure, it was yeah. great. So again, yeah, the links on the event page. If you're watching. You can just click it. And we may not have any questions, which is fine. We've just launched this, uh, the Buddhist Geeks community. We're sort of a private community on Google, uh, okay. primarily. And uh, so we, we, I think we've maybe there's a maybe 30 or so people who have part of the community now so I think there are at least a few people tuning in live but um, we're still this is a, we're still in our very early uh, beta beta phase here if you, I did have, to, if you wanted to talk a bit more I'm, I did have I did have yeah. one question that came up sure. it's, it's a little unrelated not completely unrelated but you know I was I was I was thinking as you're talking about mindfulness in the kind of MBSR sense that in some ways would it have ever become so popular had it not been formulated in a way that did fit into the current kind of uh, conception of, of what's important, you know, uh, reducing stress, um, kind of my own self-fulfillment. Like, mm -hmm. maybe that was the only way that it could have become so incredibly popular, I wonder. Yeah, I think you're probably right. Um, um, you know, I've I've looked very closely at, at John Kabat-Zinn's work, and and he actually wrote an article talking about how he 
started out and he very intentionally uh, uh, very intentionally did not want to have any type of uh, connotations that would uh, make it appear that MBSR had any uh, Buddhist uh, uh, affiliations and uh, and so you know for that particular environment and that clinical population um, it uh, it served its purpose and it does serve its purpose um, and certainly uh, everybody in our Western 24-7 society is suffering from stress so it does uh, lend itself to a, a lot of appeal uh, to our everyday concerns and I, I think uh, uh, it is an entry point uh, for sure um, it's just that if we take a longer term view uh, uh, you know Buddhism's only been here what a hundred to 50 to 100 years in, in the Western world and you know we have to look at language and discourse and, and how that can reshape our the meanings and understandings of, of these ancient practices and we have to be careful I think of um, moving too quickly uh, away from uh, the fundamental meanings and understandings that are there in the tradition uh, obviously uh, in the West and our cultural frameworks are uh, colored by uh, many other types of uh, developments uh, the Enlightenment period the romantics uh, romanticism has informed I think uh, this idea that uh, we can do everything on our own and it's all a matter of you know our self-expression and we can cherry-pick uh, this and that and, um, but uh, Buddhism, you know, had had to make its appeal to science uh, in order to survive in certain ways. It uh, kind of refashioned itself in the late 1800s, and so there's a resonance there, I think, uh, with MBSR, which tuned into that very very skillfully, I thought. Uh, but we have to evolve beyond that. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, we may even forget. 50 to 100, 150 years from now, what mindfulness really means, what it is. If we mm. think it's just stress reduction, then that 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 is what it, it will be in the history books. Mm. Okay, cool. Um, looks like we do have, uh, thanks for that response, by the way. Um, mm -hmm. Looks like we do have a question, um, uh, someone who's popped in, uh, Marie. So uh, Marie, we'll, uh, we'll make you live here, and then you can uh, chat your question. Okay, you're live. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess I, I, I had a reaction to one thing you were saying about stress and how, you know, mindfulness is used to just, you know, as some kind of just stress reduction. Um, but I guess my main mindfulness teacher is Shinzen Young. So my, you know, my exploration and understanding of mindfulness really is that you come to understand how you construct your stress. Um, so, I guess there's probably, I, I haven't really been exposed to all the many kinds of ways people are teaching mindfulness, but it sounds like we need some kind of, uh, um, some kind of taxonomy for, you know, a, a given teacher's approach to what they're teaching. So, um, so you can see, you know, what the goal is. Because it sounds like the goals are completely fuzzy. I did. I, I posted a link to uh, Shinzen's latest seventy-six page article on what is mindfulness, and he he kind he he's got a pretty interesting way of breaking it down, which makes a lot of sense to me. But well, I think the point you made is excellent about having a uh, view or having a taxonomy, is the way you put it. I think that's absolutely right, and. Um, you know, I think that is what the, the Buddhist uh, Eightfold Path was. It was that sort of uh, vision. Uh, in fact, the very first path factor was right view uh, from the beginning. Uh, you know, what is the purpose of why we're even engaging uh, on this uh, on this journey on this path? What's the uh, what's the the larger purpose uh, end goal? Uh, and you know, I, I think that you have a very good teacher. I've uh, 
watched a number of his videos and, and uh, have a couple of his CDs, and uh, I think you're in good hands with uh, Shinzen Young. I think he's uh, great. Cool. Thank you, Marie. Okay. Awesome. Cool. So, um, assuming there's there's no more questions, um, just wanted to thank you again for your time, Ron, and uh, sure. appreciate being able to explore this with you. One one topic that maybe we could have you back on to explore is this this uh, question of how Zen koans relate to uh, organizational dilemmas. Uh, <laughs> I've been reading a little bit about what you've been writing there, and it's another really interesting way that you're kind of exploring this intersection point of uh, you know organizational uh, life and practice with. Buddhist contemplative practice, and it's very fascinating. Yeah, I would love to do that. Uh, that work came out of the, the dialogue with uh, Albert Lowe, who is the uh, head abbot at the Montreal Zen Center, uh, but he was also a human resource executive for many, many years, and his book was Zen and Creative Management, which uh, was actually a bestseller back in 1976. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah, and I read it in 2003 or 2004 and I was just mesmerized by how original it was and so started to correspond with uh, with Albert and uh, became really good friends with him and uh, going to Montreal actually uh, in July to uh, present a paper that kind of develops this a little bit further for uh, pedagogical uh, applications and teaching hmm. how we can bring this into executive and management education Okay, cool. Well, I look forward to, to chatting with you about that. Uh, it's a really interesting topic. And uh, again, thank you for, for taking the time to chat with us and explore well, thank this. Thank you. Thank yeah. you very much. All right, great.